In the last lecture, we worked through the law that governs historical call records. This lecture completes the picture by addressing prospective call records. Let me start by clarifying some terminology. The technology used to collect information about outgoing calls is usually referred to as a pen register. It's sometimes also called a dialed number recorder, or DNR. The technology used to collect information about incoming calls has a different name. It's a trap-and-trace device. When police seek prospective call records, they usually want both outgoing and incoming calls. That's both a pen register and a trap-and-trace device. It's usually just called a pen trap, for short. I'd like to work through three topics on pen traps. First, a quick note on their status under the Fourth Amendment. Second, we'll work through the statutory requirements for a pen trap under the Pen Register Act. Finally, I'll touch on how pen traps work in practice and share a little data. So, let's start with the Fourth Amendment. And this is the shortest Fourth Amendment explanation in the course. Pen traps are covered by the exact same rules as historical call records. We saw in the last lecture how historical call records receive no Fourth Amendment protection because of the Third Party Doctrine. Pen traps also have no Fourth Amendment protection. All right, so that was quick. Now on to the Pen Register Act, which is the federal statutory scheme that regulates pen traps. In the last lecture, we looked at the structure of the 1986 Electronic Communications Privacy Act. The Pen Register Act is just part of ECPA, namely, the part that deals with prospective collection of communications metadata. Much like the Wiretap Act, the Pen Register Act establishes a blanket prohibition on pen traps. And again, like the Wiretap Act, the Pen Register Act includes some exceptions. One of those exceptions is for a pen trap order, which is a special type of court order that's set out in the Pen Register Act. One of the provisions of the Pen Register Act spells out what's required to apply for a pen trap order. And once again, it's not too difficult to read. The statute says that a pen trap application has to include the name of the government investigator and name of the investigating agency. It also has to include a certification that the pen trap information is relevant to an ongoing criminal investigation. So, to be very clear, the Pen Register Act imposes merely a relevance standard, like a subpoena for historical call records. And also, to be clear, while a pen trap order is a court order, it doesn't involve judicial scrutiny. The investigator self-certifies that the pen trap is relevant to an investigation. The court's role is purely administrative. Let me touch on a few other features of the Pen Register Act. It requires a time limit on pen trap orders, at most 60 days. The orders can be renewed, of course. Unlike the Wiretap Act, there is no minimization requirement in the Pen Register Act. Officers get access to all of a target's prospective call records. There also isn't a notice requirement. Pen trap orders are sealed when they're issued, and in practice, they're barely ever unsealed. Targets of pen traps can still learn about the surveillance, of course. That includes if their communications company has a policy of providing notice, 
or if they're prosecuted. A final point on pen traps is that they're roving by default. Once officers have a pen trap order, they can serve it on any communication service that the target uses. Roving wiretaps, by contrast, require special circumstances and are very rare. The last point I'd like to make about the Pen Register Act is how it defines communications metadata. The USA Patriot Act expanded the coverage of pen traps under ECPA such that they can now sweep up dialing, routing, addressing, and signaling information. It's usually called DRAS for short. The text of the statute also expressly accepts communications content and billing information from DRAS. So, I think a Venn diagram is the easiest way to keep this all straight. The Pen Register Act creates three main categories. The first is DRAS. The second is communications content. The DRAS and content categories can overlap, but when that happens, the content category trumps. The last category is information that isn't communications content, but also isn't DRAS. In order to be covered by a pen trap order, information has to fall into the pure DRAS category. Now, I promise there's a really good reason for previewing these three categories. The categories are pretty clear for conventional phone calls. They also work reasonably well for electronic messaging services, like email and instant messaging. Beyond that, though, the categories get very blurry. As we'll see in the next part of the course, courts tie themselves in knots trying to fit modern technology into these three categories. All right, that's what I wanted to say about the Pen Register Act. The last subject I want to address is how pen traps work in practice. The pen trap application process works much like an application for a warrant or a wiretap order. An investigating officer begins by providing a judge with a certification of relevance and a proposed order. The judge then makes sure the application satisfies the Pen Register Act's requirements. Recall that those requirements are just about rock bottom. Did the officer list their name and agency? And did the officer self-certify relevance to an investigation? The court then delivers its rubber stamp and provides the officer with a pen trap order. Next, much like with a wiretap order, the officer serves the pen trap order on a communications company. The company then provides assistance in accessing prospective call records. Historically, by actually tapping law enforcement into the target phone line, and in modern practice, using the J standard. From there, the calling information just rolls into law enforcement. The Pen Register Act includes a reporting requirement for federal law enforcement agencies, so it's possible to get a rough sense of how pen traps are used. For quite some time, the Department of Justice dragged its heels in publicly sharing these reports, but they're now fairly regular. So, one apparent trend is that federal agencies are increasingly turning to pen trap authority. Applications have roughly tripled or quadrupled over the past decade. Orders for outgoing calls, that is, pen registers, were historically much more common, but now are about at parity with orders for incoming calls. Let me share a couple other observations. First, pen traps remain overwhelmingly a telephone surveillance tool. They have been increasingly applied to information technology, but that's still a small minority of orders. Second, federal pen traps are mostly used for fugitive hunting and for narcotics investigations. 
That's reflected in the breakdown of how federal law enforcement agencies use pen traps. The Marshals Service is far in the lead, followed by the Drug Enforcement Administration, then the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives is a blip. All right, so that covers pen traps in practice. And that brings to a close the material on prospective collection of call records. I've updated the table of prospective collection orders to help you keep track of how pen traps fit in and how they compare to wiretap orders. In the next part of the course, we're going to take everything we've covered on phone surveillance and apply it to modern technology. The upcoming material is cutting-edge law. It's very much still playing out in the courts and in Congress.